Uh, this is a naked mole rat. You might know, you might have seen them before. And I'm going to talk about how um, an artist, which is me, is it ended up becoming obsessed with these little critters. And uh, whilst doing a computer science um, PhD, so these, these naked mole rats, they're kind of like the holy grail of mammals, and I'll tell you a little bit why I think that later. But first, I want to talk about data. And I work, I run the, the, an art program for the Open Data Institute, and I work with Queen Mary University, so I have kind of two different hats, and I, I have my own art practice. But I want to talk about data because I know that everyone's really tired of hearing about it, apart from the previous talk, which is really interesting about data. Um, but I think it's been ruined a little bit by people like Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and GDPR. We're really, our inboxes are completely overloaded with people talking to us about personal data and what to do with it. And I think that um, one of the things that we need to think about data is it's not, it's not necessarily all bad. It's not about controlling. It's not about maybe the economic system, that it can be used in a lot of other ways. So, oh, which I need to press in the wrong... So I think, I mean, our world is made of data, and I think data is magnific magnificent because of the good things that we can do with it. And I don't mean that there's sort of good data. I mean that there is data that can be good. It can be used in a good way to do good things. And I think that when we consider data, it's important to remember this side of the story because we don't often hear about um, the good stuff. What we hear about is shrinking civic spaces. We hear about the near elimination of privacy, and we hear about sort of mass surveillance. And those things are really important to talk about. But actually, there's a, there's a flip side. And it's easy to, to get unbalanced because the data about the media tells us that we're much more interested in kind of conflict and, and chaos. So these are just some quick examples of why data can be used for good. So it can be the, the voice recordings can be analyzed to help cure Parkinson's. We can contribute data to open street map to help save humanitarian crises, such as um, in Haiti in kind of 2010, I think it was, for the earthquake. And it can be used to combat infectious diseases in places like Uganda, where data visualization played a massive part in helping to control typhoid. And also, more broadly, the idea that we're spreading and communicating data more widely means that issues around inequalities to do with gender, race, and other uh, inequalities have surfaced, and it means that we're taking action around them. So particularly, you know, this, the, the gender pay gap data is really beginning to change things because we've got something concrete that we can say this is really happening. And of course, data gives us all the cats and dogs that are on our social media streams that we really love to see. So it, data brings us a lot of joy. And this is a piece of work called Ceiling Cat by artists uh, Eva and Franco Mates. And um, they made a physical representation of, of a meme, and we've actually got this taxidermied cat installed in the Open Data Institute offices, so it peers down on us <laughs> when we're having meetings. <laughs> if you look up Ceiling Cat, you'll see the memes. Some of it's not for um, repeat on a, on a stage. But I'm particularly interested in how our natural world has become very much about data. So, this idea that um, we are measuring and instrumenting the whole world means that the way that we're connecting to the world is through, often through a stream of data. And our lives are kind of shaped, uh, shaped by it. And so, for me, one of the, the, the ways that technology can really um, have an impact is by allowing us to experience things in real time from living systems through data experiences or data artwork. So I use data in this context. I use data as an art material. And the reason that I think it's really important to, to talk about data as an art material is because as soon as something becomes something that you can play with as an artist, it becomes something that is flexible, it's malleable, it's manipulatable. It's all the things that you can do with it that aren't possible if it was on a blockchain. Um, and it allows you to use it and tell many different stories and use it to, to kind of weave different narratives. So it's got this idea of um, subjectivity rather than being data as truth or evidence. So saying that, I also use it in a rigorous way for, for um, biological sciences, and I'll tell you how that happens as well. So I want you to hold on to the idea that data isn't this binary thing. It's not a single thing that can be used only in one way. 
It can be used in many ways, and the reason it can is because, as humans, we interpret materials in different ways, and we tell the story that fits our agenda. This is where the naked mole rats come in. So this is Chris Falks. He's my collaborator at Queen Mary University, and this is a guy we call our saviour, who he met. I love that Chris is looking so cool, and actually, he's like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so I met Chris, he's a biologist, and I'm, I was in the computer science department, and there's a tea room that sits physically in between the, the two departments. And I was looking around, so as an aside, I do a bit of taxidermy as a hobby, so I was interested in, I've got some small creatures in my freezer that I thought it would be good to freeze dry them because they're very small and too difficult to taxidermy. So while I was in the, uh, I spotted him in the tea room and I was like, Chris, uh, I didn't know him, I said, have you, have you got a freeze dryer in the biology department? And he looked at me and said, why do you want that? And I said, um, oh, I've got some frozen mammals in my freezer, I'd really like to freeze dry them. And as the words came out of my mouth, I was like, you can't be saying that to strangers, this isn't going to go well. And, and but to his credit, Chris just went, yeah, I've got small mammals in my freezer. I was like, yes, <laughs> amazing. So that was the beginning of a really beautiful collaboration. And then we got to talking about naked mole rats. And he told me that he got all these naked mole rats. I said, I want a live feed of data from animals as an art material. And so um, an animal tracking project uh, came into existence. These are naked mole rats. I'll briefly tell you why they're so amazing. And you might have seen them. They've been on the TV. They're quite popular. But they've got some amazing properties as mammals. So they can live for about 10 times longer than any other mammal of their size. They're, about, they're a little bit bigger than a mouse, smaller than a rat. And you can see that they, they live together in these underground tunnels. And they're really highly adapted to living in a high carbon dioxide, low oxygen environment. And the, um, some tests, some experiments recently showed that they can live for 18 minutes without any oxygen at all. So that's incredible. I mean, their, their physiology is really quite something. They've also got, in their skin, they're highly resistant to certain types of pain. Um, they have, one of my favourite facts is that they've got these big teeth that you can see, but they can move them independently like chopsticks. It's really useful. Um, and they... <laughs> They're also cancer resistant. So you imagine that there's a, there's a mammal out there that is resistant to cancer and it can live for, 30, for 10 times longer. So you, people are really studying the genetic makeup of these animals to try and understand how they can help us. It makes sense to be eventually gene spliced with a naked mole rat so that we live a long time. We don't get cancer. One of the more fascinating things on top of that, is that they live in a eusocial society. So they, are, um, they have a breeding, single breeding queen in the community. And the community can be anything from um, kind of 30 animals up to about 300. Single breeding queen. And the way that she controls the fertility of all the other females and males in the colony is by sort of pushing and shoving. She has this kind of psychological dominance that she manages to exert. And she holds the rest of the community in a sort of um, pre-pubescent state. If you take one of the females out of the community and put her on her own, within about two weeks, her ovaries start producing eggs. So it's really strange that it's, a, um, it's not a, uh, a chemical thing. It's literally this behavior that, that, that makes that happen. So we developed a program called Rat Systems. And this uses animal tracking from the colony and we get a real-time feed of data. You can see the sensors in that image. And we use RFID. It's quite basic tracking technology, but it gives us a feed of all the individual animals, where they are, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And with that data, we can do lots of different things with it. So here's about a single set of data, and I'll explain how we used it in a multitude of ways. So firstly... And probably most obvious, we did a, a data visualization so we could see what was happening. And we ended up creating this work, and you can see it online at rat.systems. Uh, then you can see where the animals are at any one time. You can scroll back and forth on a timeline. So this is quite a basic symbolic representation of the nest. <clears throat> and you can see what the animals are doing. And that's, I think that's relatively straightforward. We also then wanted to look at the patterns of activity. So one of the things in the community, these animals have been studied manually, using manual observation by someone sitting in the lab, looking at them and seeing what happens. Because we've got this data feed, 
so we know what they're doing all the time, we can just analyze the data to see what they're doing, and we could tell um, that they have sort of territories that they um, patrol. So you can see the, the sensor two and sensor four that's highlighted, that these animals have very specific regions that they stay in. And so we know now that naked mole rat communities have roles that they play. And those roles change over time. The queen there is indicated in orange at the top. You can see that she patrols a lot. The reason she patrols a lot, it's, this is a really terrible slide, but you can see that this is the queen in light blue. She travels three, nearly three times the distance of every other animal in that colony. So the reason she manages to keep them, the rest of them infertile, except a couple of breeding males, is that she literally patrols the nest and she runs over the top of them to keep them in their place. And she does that and she, uses, she must use three times as much energy. So these are really significant new findings that um, me and, and Dr. Fawkes have, have come out of the research. And it's interesting because this starts and is an art project. We also looked at their kind of circadian rhythm to see whether they had a sleep pattern like normal mammals where they sleep for a chunk of time and then stay awake, but they don't. They, they pretty much stay awake and run around all the time. The peak is from when we feed them around about midday. And then the, um, the rest of the time they sleep for sort of 20 minute chunks. So again, we found some significant findings that no one else has really known about these animals, even though they've been studied for many decades. That's kind of the science and the data visualization. But I wanted to use the data as an art material. So what I'm going I'm to try and do live demo now, see if it works. Oh, good work, people backstage. That was amazing. I'm really impressed. This is the, so this is what you're seeing here is a real-time feed of the animal data. And each animal in the, in the lab, as it moves around, it, it controls different variables in, in the animation. So what you can see, uh, the different shapes and symbols represent different masses and speeds and things like that. And this, you can explore the data by zooming in and zooming out. And you can, ooh, even though it looks two-dimensional, it's set in a three-dimensional framework. So you can spin around and look at the data from different aspects. And what I wanted to do with this piece of work was to use data expressively. So to see it, there's not much information in here. And you can tell that the animals are moving together. You can see that they're doing different things and that um, they've got some kind of cohesion. I can't spin it back around now. But the idea is to see what the essence of the data might be. And the fact that the animals, so for me in my artwork, I like to set up these systems and allow the data to pour into them so I feel like I relinquish control over the final result. I never know when I look at the, the program, and this is uh, live online as well, what it's going to look like, where they're going to be, how they're going to be moving. So although I feel like artistically I have control over the, all of the parameters, the animals get to do what they, they want within that, albeit unwittingly. Um, can we flick back to the slides? Seamless. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I also wanted to look at how we could physicalize this data. So I didn't want to just think about screen-based animation. It's one thing. I wanted to think about how we could make an object. And so we were thinking about how the naked mole rats could be creating kind of gestures within physical devices that would then appeal to an audience. And I wanted to evoke, I wanted to have the objects have a lifelike um, sort of appearance. So I worked with a soft roboticist to make a piece of work that called This Is Nature Now. And this is about physicalizing data and how rather than understanding data through the graphs and the charts or the numbers, wouldn't it be nice if we could suddenly look at an object and the object was, had a body language of its own which was telling us something. So if this was a data-driven lampshade, for instance, when the bulb was wearing out, the lampshade itself might kind of like crumble down a little bit. And you'd think, oh, look, something's wrong with my lampshade. I need to give it more power, change its bulb, whatever it may be. And so that sense of a sort of body language of objects is something that we explored through these soft robotics. So what you're seeing here is three uh, of a number of objects. And they're designed not to map where the animals are in their locations, but they're designed 
to have a complexity that maps to the complexity of the behaviour of the animal. So we used some mathematic techniques to look at how predictable each animal was, the queen being the most kind of um, complex in her predictability. And then we used that to map to a series of choreographed movements so that you end up with these kind of small sort of dancing objects. And these are powered by a pneumatic system. So depending on the, the amount of data and the way that the data flows into the, the, the motors depends on how these soft objects move. And what I wanted to do was to create works that were quite slow and contemplative because if you've got something in your home, like an Alexa, you don't want it bouncing around all over the place. You want it to have a body language that is smooth and fluid like a living, a living thing. And when we did the tests, um, the, the user experience tests on this piece of work, we found that people really responded to them as if they were alive. And for me, that's quite successful because it means that the, the life in the data was transferred to the life in the object. And then finally, um, another piece of work inspired by the data. This doesn't use the data directly, but it's more conceptually about the data. I commissioned a series of photographs by Lorna Ellen Fawkes. And she took pictures of every single animal in the community. And they're beautiful photographs. They're not ugly. Mr. Bingo was like, oh, aren't they really ugly? <laughs> they're really cute, I think. Um, but what I found out was that sometimes when um, people are on safari taking pictures of elephants or, or whatever they might be seeing, they're using, leaving the geotag switched on on the photographs and posting them on social media. Poachers are then scanning social media sites for those images and being directed exactly to where the elephant or the giraffe or whatever it might be is. So there's a kind of breach of animal privacy. And we're really up to date now, more than ever actually, with our personal privacy about location data, but we need to think about animal privacy <clears throat> and we need to think about environmental privacy. So if there's a rare bee orchid somewhere, if you take a picture and do the same thing, the chances are a collector may come, <clears throat> may come and want to take that orchid away. So we need to think about data privacy across the board. It's not just about us. Is one of my favourite pictures. This little creature, we tried to get them to stand still by putting a heat map, a heat map under the uh, photography, the little light box. And this one just went... <laughs> it's like that, it's really warm, didn't move at all. And you can see, we pick, you pick them up by the scruff of their neck and you can see where his skin has just stayed in the sort of finger position. Really brilliant. So these are all the different faces of data, you know, visualisation, a straightforward use of data, abstract representation and sort of expressive use of data, actual facts and new findings about the behaviour of the animals, a sort of conceptual piece of photography and then these soft robotic objects. But all of it comes from one place, and all of it come, came together because of all the different people that I worked with. So this highly collaborative project even surprised me. So an artist in a computer science department ended up working with a biologist, a data scientist, a visualizer, a photographer, mathematicians, and soft roboticists. And it became a really big project where everybody's skills started to overlap and interchange. And it really made me realize that although Fundamentally, I'm working with data. It's the people and the humanity in that project that really made it work and made it so successful. And you can get the app. Download. Thank you.